Okay, good morning, everyone. First of all, thank you all for coming to the uh, to this talk and taking the time for it. I'll see, I'll, I'm seeing that some people are still entering, so I'll first give a brief introduction. So I'm Mati Van Oof. I'm a professor at KU Leuven University, and together with uh, two collaborators, so Domin Schepers and uh, Ajan Ganganathan, uh, we did some Wi-Fi security research, and we will be presenting this today. And I also want to thank the organizers for Black Hat for organizing the conference. It's always a pleasure to speak here. So first and for all, let me start with a bit of background on Wi-Fi security before we get into the meat of the talk. And if you look at the history of Wi-Fi security, we can see that initially we had WEP, so web encryption, and that was very quickly shown to be horribly broken. If you know that history, you know that you can very easily break the password and get access to the network. Then we had WPA1 and 2 for a long time. Um, that is vulnerable to offline password brute force attacks. And a few years ago, we also showed that, that, that it was vulnerable to key reinstallation attacks and the follow-up of that, the Kraken attack. These have meanwhile been patched. And then a few years ago, WPA3 was introduced. And WPA3 provides uh, better protection against uh, password brute force attacks. We did discover some side channel in that, uh, but that has also meanwhile been fixed. And basically, if today you run a fully updated Wi-Fi network, then you should be pretty secure. So let's say you, as an adversary, want to attack a Wi-Fi network and the target device is fully updated. What can you try to do to get access or to still break Wi-Fi? Well, one recent attack that I didn't mention yet is called the Crook vulnerability. And this was actually also presented at Black here, I think, uh, around two years ago. And the Crook vulnerability exploited an implementation flaw in the Wi-Fi access point. And I'm at a high level going to explain how this attack works, because the work that we did will build on that attack. So let's say that we have a Wi-Fi access point here on the right, and it is vulnerable to this Crook implementation flaw. What does that mean in practice? So this is an existing attack. And let's say the access point wants to transmit an encrypted data frame to a client. But the access point notices, oh, other people are transmitting, uh, so the Wi-Fi channel is not yet clear. And it will then store that frame in the memory and wait until the Wi-Fi channel is clear and the frame can be transmitted. Now, the interesting thing now that uh, was previously discovered here is if the attacker now spoofs a disassociation frame, which is not protected in WPA2, and a disassociation frame basically means, hey, I'm the client and I'm going to leave the network, then these researchers, they found out that um, a vulnerable access point will remove the session keys, so the encryption keys associated to the victim, but these buffered frames here, they will stay in memory. And it turns out that if then uh, the Wi-Fi channel becomes clear, so uh, the access point can transmit, then these buffered frames are still being transmitted. But yeah, the access point removed the encryption keys associated to that client, and now these frames are then leaked in plain text. And yeah, this is a very interesting vulnerability that they found. And it basically gave us some inspiration to look also for variants of this attack. And yeah, to ask the more academic question, basically we have a frame here that is uh, stored in the buffer under a certain security context, what we call it. And the question is, can we cause the transmission of frames under a different security context? Now, I'm not going to get into details here. Uh, today, I'm just going to present the cool attacks. And the first attack that we found is that we found a new way to cause a vulnerable access point to leak frames in plain text or to leak them um, in a way that we as an adversary can decrypt them. Well, let me go into the details of that. So we again assume that we have an access point here that will be vulnerable. And we then also have our victim here and the attacker that is within range of the victim on the access point. The victim will first connect to the access point, as is usual. And then we, as an attacker, will start the attack. 
Um, the first thing that we will do is we will spoof a so-called power safe frame and pretend that it comes from the victim and we send it to the access point. And even in a WPA3 network, we can spoof these power save uh, frames and we can basically pretend that the client is going into power save mode so that it is going into sleep mode. And as a result of that, when the access point now wants to send a frame to the victim, the access point will buffer that frame because the access point thinks, yeah, the client is asleep, it won't be able to receive it. And that's, in a sense, our first novelty. We can very uh, easily control when an access point will buffer frames towards a victim. That's the first part of the attack. The second part is that we will now use a new way to make the access point remove the encryption key associated to the victim, so associated to the client. And basically, instead of sending this disassociation frame, which tells the access point, hey, I'm the client and I'm going to leave, we are going to spoof an authentication or association frame. And if you're not familiar with Wi-Fi, what's an authentication or association frame? Well, it's a bit like the name implies. It basically says, hey, I'm the client and I want to connect to the network. And if a client wants to initiate a new connection to the network, that basically means that the state of the old connection will get removed. Because this client apparently wants to initiate a new connection, so the old state gets deleted. Meaning, the old keys that were associated to this client, so that the access point was saving in memory, they are now here cleared from memory. Basically, we can pretend to be the client, we can pretend that we want to initiate a new connection, and this will cause the access point to remove the client's keys. And yeah, the access point will respond saying, yes, you can connect. Then we move on to the second part of the attack. So at this point, we have now caused the access point to buffer some frames, because the access point thinks that the client is in sleep mode. And we've now removed the encryption key associated to the client. Well, maybe you can see now where this is going. If we now spoof a wake-up frame, which again is possible even in WPA3, we can basically tell the access point, okay, hey, I'm the client again, and yeah, by the way, I'm awake now, so please send me any buffered frames that you have. And the access point will do exactly that. It will send these buffered frames, but we just caused the access point to remove the encryption key associated to the client. And this means, we call it that these frames are then sent under an undefined security context. Now, what do I mean with that? What do I mean with an undefined security context? Well, let me explain this with an example from FreeBSD. And uh, FreeBSD supports Wi-Fi, and sometimes it even works. And what happens with FreeBSD? Well, the way that this frame here is leaked in this previous slide depends on the specific driver, Wi-Fi dongle, and operating system being used. For example, on a certain version of a driver, the frame is simply leaked in plain text, and yeah, then we as an attacker can just uh, know the content of that frame. Interestingly, if we update the driver to the next uh, minor version, then suddenly this driver will use the very broken web protocol, and it will even encrypt it using an all zero key. And of course, we can then decrypt that frame ourselves as the attacker because yeah, they use a known key to send that frame. And there's also an, another edge case with a different driver where this frame is then encrypted using the group key. Um, but basically, if you are a malicious insider in a network, for example, if you have a rogue employee or a hotspot with an untrusted individual, then that person will also know the group key and will be able to decrypt the frames. But basically, the takeaway message here, the one thing to remember is that we as an adversary can then uh, decrypt that frame or we just get access to the plain text. And we found several open source operating systems vulnerable to this. So for example, Linux, NetBSD, and also some open source Atheros firmware that really runs on the Wi-Fi dongle itself. Now, in the research that 
was done for the crook attack, they considered this an implementation vulnerability, and in a sense it also is. But our view now, now that we have discovered that this implementation vulnerability is even more widespread than previously assumed, I think we can say that this is actually a flaw in the Wi-Fi standard because they were not explicit enough in how to manage these buffered frames. Basically, the standard should be more explicit. For example, they, the standard should say that if the key changes or is deleted associated to a client, then all the buffered frames should be dropped. And that is then also one possible mitigation. A second mitigation is instead of buffering frames in plain text, is to encrypt the frames before you put them into uh, the buffer, so before you put them into the transmit queue. That is, for example, also done with uh, other protocols like TLS, and that's why they don't suffer from that vulnerability. So this covers our first attack. In our second attack, we have another new way that we can basically abuse sleep mode to uh, yeah, play around a bit with the target Wi-Fi network. And in this case, we're going to abuse uh, the sleep mode to basically perform denial of service attacks. Now, I think most people in this room will be familiar or at least have heard about some famous denial of service attacks against Wi-Fi. In particular, we have the quite well-known deauthentication attack, where you basically spoof deauthentication frames and a deauthentication frame basically says, hey, I'm the client and I want to disconnect from the network. And this attack was very easily possible against WPA2. You could very easily kick uh, clients from the network. And there is actually a bit of a lesser known variant of that attack. Instead of spoofing a so-called disconnect frame, you can also spoof a I want to connect frame. So you can also spoof an association request which basically tells the access point, hey, I'm the client, and I want to start a new connection, because that also causes the client to get disconnected. Because if the access point notices that the client wants, wants to create a new connection, then it will delete the old connection. So this is a known attack, and with the introduction of WPA3, it is now mandatory to implement a defense against these denial of service attacks to make them harder. And that defense is called management frame protection, and you might have also heard about it uh, under the official IEEE name, so that's 802.11w, but basically here, management frame protection, that will protect management frames, and these two frames, the deauthentication and association frames, they are both management frames. So by using management frame protections, these two frames will be protected. And yeah, actually, management, frames, management frame protection existed for a very long time, uh, for more than a decade, but it was never really adopted uh, because it had some reliability issues in practice. But with WPA3, this is now becoming mandatory, meaning implementations must support it. And this sounds nice. It sounds like, okay, we're finally going to defend against these denial of service attacks. But we found a way to still perform denial of service attacks even when you're using WPA3. And I will now explain how we, were, how we are still able to perform a denial of service attack even when management frame protection is being used. So here we have the same uh, network diagram as before, we assume that we have a client here uh, that is using WPA3 to connect to a vulnerable access point. So it will be the access point that is vulnerable. And because this network is using WPA3, uh, sorry, it will also use management frame protection. So it, up to this point, everything is normal. What we now do as an attacker is we are going to spoof the following frame towards the access point. We are again going to spoof an association request frame. So this is a frame that tells the access point, hey, I'm the client and I want to start a new connection. And in this Wi-Fi frame, in the header, I can also set a flag indicating, oh, by the way, I'm also going into sleep mode. 
Now, in a sense, this is very strange um, because the client is saying, I want to connect, but at the same time, I'm immediately going into sleep mode. This doesn't really make sense, but it is possible. And access points will just accept this as, yeah, sure, okay, you want to start a new connection, but you're going into sleep mode, fine by me. Now, the access point is using management frame protection which means that the access point knows that this association request is quite easy to spoof because yeah, it is not uh, cryptographically protected. Meaning initially the access point will actually reject this new connection attempt because the access point knows, yeah, actually the client is already connected and you're now trying to connect again. I don't know if you are the real client and it is going to reject this new connection request, and it, instead it will initiate what is called an SA query. And basically what is happening here is that uh, the access point is asking, hey, real client, are you still connected? And this SA query is cryptographically protected. So the idea is that if the access point receives an authenticated reply to that, then the access point would really know, okay, yes, the real client is still connected. Now, as you can see here, something strange is going on because this SA query, basically this question to the real client, are you still there? It's not actually reaching the client. And why is that happening? Well, typically, in user space, there is a Wi-Fi daemon which sends this SA query, and it will think that this question to the client gets transmitted, but the kernel knows that, oh, actually this client is in sleep mode because just before this, we received this frame that says, okay, I'm the client, I'm going into sleep mode. So actually the kernel says, oh no, wait a bit, the client is asleep, so I'm gonna have to wait with sending that question. And what does the user space daemon then think after a while? Well, it realizes, hey, I'm actually never receiving an answer to this question. Are you the real client and are you nearby? So according to the user space daemon, the, the real client is not there anymore, even though it might actually be, be there. And as a result of that, the real client will get disconnected from the network. So basically, by spoofing this association request with the bit that indicates that the client is going into sleep mode, we can, in a sense, bypass management frame protection and still disconnect clients from the network. Now, we also discovered other denial of service attacks. Um, for those, I'm going to refer you to our white paper. Basically, we can also mess around with what is called fine timing measurements. And this is basically a feature that enables your Wi-Fi device, so your phone, to measure how far away it is from an access point. And this is basically used for localization. And yeah, by abusing this sleep mode, by spoofing that the client is going into sleep mode, we can basically pretend that the client thinks it is somewhere else. And then you can possibly abuse that to uh, mess around with geofencing or other stuff. So how can we now defend against these attacks? How can we uh, improve the situation? Well, the first is that the access point should never buffer these SA query frames. So these questions to the real client, are you still there? They should just never be buffered. They should always be sent, even if you think that the real client is in sleep mode. And that is one possible defense. The second possible defense is that we should update the Wi-Fi protocol so that this sleep bit is authenticated so that only the real Wi-Fi client can tell the access point that I'm going, to, going into sleep mode. Because now, even with WPA3, it's possible to spoof Wi-Fi frames and to trick the access point into thinking a client is going into sleep mode. Unfortunately, though, that would require an update to the protocol, um, and that would take a long time to get standardized and implemented. So basically, the Wi-Fi standard should be updated with one of these defenses. <laughs>
So that's our second attack. Basically here, we were able to abuse sleep mode to perform some denial of service attacks. In the third attack, we're going to do something a little bit different. And the result of this attack is that we will be able to bypass client isolation. And sometimes this is also called AP isolation. Now, maybe out of curiosity, who knows what client isolation is? If you know it, raise your hand, or if you've used it. So not many people. So what is client isolation, and what is uh, client isolation specifically in a Wi-Fi network? Well, the idea is that, let's say you have a Wi-Fi network. Possibly there are malicious insiders in that Wi-Fi network. For example, in your company Wi-Fi network, you might have to take into account that you might have a rogue employee or that the device might get compromised. Then you want to prevent that this compromised or malicious device can attack other Wi-Fi clients in your Wi-Fi network. And that is exactly what client isolation does. It will basically prevent Wi-Fi clients from directly communicating with each other. This is, for example, also very useful if you connect an IoT device to your Wi-Fi network. You don't want this IoT device to connect to other uh, clients because yeah, that might uh, make it much easier for malware to spread to, to, through your network uh, or whatever. And other types of uh, network-based attacks like ARP spoofing is also prevented. Basically, you isolate clients from each other so that they cannot attack each other and so that they also cannot intercept each other's traffic. Now, a small little quick remark for people that are a bit familiar with Wi-Fi. When you use client isolation, all clients will also have a unique encryption key, and that basically prevents some other known Wi-Fi attacks. But if you don't know what the whole uh, 196 attack is, don't worry, you don't have to know that. Just remember that Wi-Fi client isolation prevents or defends against malicious insiders. And what are we as an attacker now going to do? Well, we're going to partially bypass client isolation. Let me first start with the exact target, um, with the exact description of the network that we are going to attack. So we assume that the target is a network that uses client isolation. And I gave uh, some examples of that. And to make this a bit more concrete, in Belgium, in Belgium we, for example, have this, uh, these public hotspots called Wi-Free from uh, our local ISP. And basically, if you have the, your own ISP credentials, you can connect to these free Wi-Fi hotspots all over the country. So basically, it's a Wi-Fi hotspot where everyone can connect to, but you do need a username and a password. So it is a protected Wi-Fi network, but it will be a network where you do not trust the other people. It's the same like with the Ethereum network in uh, universities, or you also have this new, uh, or new, it's already existed for a while, the hotspot 2.0 standard which is basically also a new type of Wi-Fi hotspot where you can, for example, automatically authenticate using your uh, SIM card. So this is, again, a Wi-Fi hotspot that uses, for example, WPA2 or 3 encryption, but other people that you don't trust will also connect to that network. Um, and another example might be this network right here at Black Hat. You probably also don't trust everyone. So basically, we're assuming that we as an adversary can connect to this network, and then we want to attack other people. So how does our, our attack look like? Well, we have our access point here that we assume that will be vulnerable. We have our client, and right nearby we have our adversary. The client will connect to the network using, say, WPA2 or even WPA3. And at some point, this client will then send some kind of network request to the internet. For example, it will send a plain text uh, DNS request to its DNS server, uh, 
or it will send a plain text or yeah, perhaps even encrypted HTTP request to some random server on the internet. So the client will first send this request over the Wi-Fi connection. It will be received by the access point. This network will then forward it to the local router and the router will forward this request to the internet to the final destination server. And it will take a little bit of time before we get a response, so we, before we get a DNS reply or HTTP response. And before this response arrives, we will do the following. We as an attacker are going to spoof the MAC address of the client because it's very easy to sniff that, to learn the MAC address. And we are then going to initiate a connection with the access point using the client's MAC address. So remember that we as an adversary also have the co correct credentials to connect to the network because basically we assume that we are a malicious insider. Now what will happen here? Because the access point will now re realize, oh, a client is connecting using a MAC address that is basically already in use because this MAC address that we are spoofing here, yeah, it's already used by the real client. And what will then happen? Well, basically, when we as an adversary are then connecting using our own credentials, we will negotiate some kind of session key with the access point, and this session key will now be associated with the victim's MAC address. So a different way to think about this is that the access point stores certain data of the victim and it will associate that data to the MAC address of the victim and then by spoofing the MAC address of that client and connecting using that MAC address, we basically overwrite the data that is associated with the victim's MAC address. So in a sense, the attack is very simple. You just spoof the MAC address and you connect under it. It's very easy to do. And what will now happen when finally this DNS reply or this HTTP reply arrives back at the local network? Well, this reply will be received at the router. The router will realize, okay, I have to forward it to some kind of internal IP address. So this packet will be forwarded to the correct access point. The access point will look up in its cache what the MAC address uh, is that is associated to the IP address of the client. And the MAC address will basically realize, okay, I need to forward this frame to the MAC address of the client. And now here comes the interesting part. The access point will look up the key associated to the MAC address of the client. But that is now the key belonging to the adversary. Because the adversary basically spoofed the MAC address of the client, and the access point will forward this packet here to the MAC address of the client, of the victim, which basically means that the adversary will now receive that reply. Because if we here in the previous uh, step here spoof the client MAC address and connect using that to the network, we're basically kicking off the real client from the network and all pending traffic that would normally, normally be sent to the victim's MAC address yeah, will now be sent to our MAC address because we spoofed the victim's MAC address. Which basically means that we will now be receiving all pending frames uh, that were still coming from the internet. Now, one remark here is that we need to be able to perform this attack fast enough before the reply uh, is received um, by the network, but we have some uh, clever techniques to do this, and you can read our white paper for those details. So that's the attack. I hope that was a bit clear. Then the question becomes, how can we fix this? Well, one way to fix this is to prevent a recently used MAC address from, from immediately reconnecting to the network. Now, that would not be a complete defense because if this reply from the internet takes a long time to arrive, then an adversary would still be able to intercept that, but it would at least 
mitigate the most serious damage. One downside also of this is that if a client legitimately wants to reconnect using its own MAC address, then this defense can cause some reliability issues. Um, there are ways to prevent these reliability issues. Basically, if you can be somehow completely sure that it's the same client that is trying to reconnect, you can immediately allow that uh, connection. Now, what's probably the most interesting for you here today is our vendors actually implementing this defense? And the answer is no. Basically, th these defenses uh, are fairly costly, and the impression I have is that these costs to implement the defense don't uh, outweigh the advantages. So currently in pra practice, there are very few vendors that adopt this. So if you ever test the Wi-Fi network of a company, testing this attack might be a good idea because there's a high chance it will work. If you do want to somehow defend against this, the advice is to use VLANs because um, the attack does not work across VLANs. So if you are an attacker in VLAN A and your victim is in VLAN B, then you cannot perform this attack. Um, at least not in general or not that I know of. So how can you test your own network now? Well, we created a tool for this. Basically, this tool first has some sanity checks to make sure the tool works. We can then test for the vulnerability, and we can then also double check, OK, is the network actually using Wi-Fi client isolation? Because this attack only makes sense if the network actually is using client isolation. Because if the target network is not using Wi-Fi client isolation, then actually more simple attacks are possible. Now, let me give a demo of this uh, attack. So I have an example here where I'm configuring the tool to test the Ubiquiti device. And I basically specify the properties of the network. As you can see here, this network has client isolation enabled. And I'm first going to do a sanity check. I'm first going to check if client-to-client -client traffic is allowed or not. So I'm not yet testing for the vulnerability. I'm simply checking whether client isolation is enabled. And in this case, the tool is connecting using two Wi-Fi dongles to the network, and it will then send frames from one Wi-Fi dongle to the other. And you can see here, indeed, client-to-client -client traffic appears to be disabled. All right. Let's now actually try to perform the attack. And yeah, we can again run our script. Our script will first pretend to be the victim, and then it will immediately reconnect as the attacker. And it will then try to see, am I now receiving frames from the victim? And here you can actually see that, in this case, Ubiquiti is one of the few vendors that implemented a mitigation against this, and the attack actually doesn't succeed. Now, the mitigation, as I mentioned, isn't perfect, but in this case, our script will detect uh, that in this case, the network did implement this mitigation. So, yeah, if you have a Ubiquiti the device, um, then they did a good job because they are one of the few that actually implemented a mitigation against this. If you now want to try this out uh, yourself, you can um, use this tool, look up the tool online. It's on GitHub. And we also tested a lot of uh, networks, uh, well, a lot of, lot of routers using these tools. And all routers that we tested were vulnerable. So basically, this indicates that this is a design flaw in Wi-Fi client isolation. Now, let me briefly discuss the the root cause of this vulnerability. How come that this vulnerability, for example, was not detected before? Well, if you look at um, how a client is identified in a Wi-Fi network, then we can see that the identity of the client is not properly synchronized across the full network stack. For example, when we are connecting to a Wi-Fi network, 
The identity of the client is, for example, verified using the username or using certificates. So in the technical term, it's using an 802.1x identity. But once the client has authenticated, then all the routing decisions are based on the IP address, on the MAC address. And there is basically no strong uh, tie to these different identities to uh, represent the client. And this is basically the root cause of the vulnerability. Another reason why perhaps this was only discovered now is because client isolation was, in a sense, bolted on by vendors as just some extra defense that might be useful. But client isolation is never, was never part of a real Wi-Fi standard. And I think that is one reason why people didn't study it in as much detail. Uh, and it's probably also one reason why this is only discovered now. So that brings me to the conclusion of the talk. The conclusion is that the Wi-Fi standard is a bit vague in how buffered frames should be managed, and that leads to some implementation flaws. And the second takeaway is that we can partially bypass client isolation. So if you have a Wi-Fi network, it's still good to use client isolation because it is still harder uh, for one client to attack another client in the network because they cannot directly send frames to each other. But using our attack, we can intercept certain frames. So basically, yes, please keep using Wi-Fi client isolation, but just realize that it's not perfect. Um, and the other takeaway is that this attack is hard to fully prevent, and it will be interesting to see how vendors will uh, deal with this in the future. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, feel free to ask. OK, so let me repeat the question. So if they got the question right, it was one defense that I mentioned is use VLANs. But your question is, how would that help? So that's a good question. Basically, it's not a perfect solution, because you cannot put each individual client in a separate VLAN. That doesn't scale. And as far as I know, I, I don't know if it's possible. But one thing you could do is, um, Let's say if you have a network and you have, for example, employees on guests that use the same network, then you can at least put them in different VLANs, or you can put IoT devices in one VLAN and other devices in another VLAN and other devices in another VLAN. So at least you can use that. So with VLANs, you can isolate groups, but yeah, unfortunately, you cannot isolate all devices still from each other. So it's not perfect, but it's something. Yes, so the question was in this second attack, and let me go to the slide. There, the authentication frame um, was, in a sense, rejected. So if we go here, we can see this, well, this association request was rejected, but the sleep bit in that frame was accepted. And I agree that's actually a, a bit strange. Why does that happen? One possible explanation why this happened, happens in practice is because the kernel will interpret the sleep bit, but it's the daemon in user space that then rejects the actual association request. But in a way, I actually agree with you. It would be a good defense if the kernel would also just already ignore the association request. That's actually a good idea as well, yes. Any other? Questions? No, if not, I'll also be available after the talk to answer 
any questions. And like I mentioned, the tool is also online. So thank you again for your time and your attention.